Hello and welcome to lecture number four. Today's topic will be civil rights. In a way, the approach for this topic will be twofold. Uh, first of all, I want to investigate a range of issues from more of a historical perspective. And secondly, um, I'll address African Americans first and then women and how African Americans and women were impacted by the Civil Rights Movement. To begin with, we should start with three amendments passed in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. The first of these amendments was the 13th Amendment, which became part of the Constitution in 1865. You can see the text of the 13th Amendment there. Well, a bunch of lawyers wrote that. Essentially, we can break this down into just two words. The 13th Amendment prohibited slavery. Some have argued the 14th Amendment is the most important amendment outside of the Bill of Rights. It has two main provisions. First of all, it helped to define citizenship and declared all persons born in the United States are citizens. That's all fine and dandy, but what does citizenship get you? Well, that's the second provision. Citizens are guaranteed equal treatment under the law. The 15th Amendment is the last of these Civil War amendments. The bottom line is that it guaranteed the right of all black men to vote. On paper, those Civil War amendments provided tremendous opportunity for African Americans. Yet, what ended up happening was that um, segregation became legal in the United States. I'd like to explore the legal basis for segregation next. Segregation based on race was confirmed by a Supreme Court decision in the 1890s called Plessy versus Ferguson. This dealt with the law in Louisiana where all railroad cars were segregated by law. The Supreme Court declared that separate facilities for people of different races were okay. They were legal as long as they were equal in quality. This gave us the so-called separate but equal doctrine. Once the Supreme Court declared that it was legal to segregate based on race, state and local communities passed their own laws. These were often referred to as Jim Crow laws. These were state and local laws that established segregation all over the country. Restrooms, drinking fountains, schools, movie theaters, sports stadiums, courtrooms were all segregated. People called this cradle to grave segregation because it began at birth, like with hospitals, and it didn't end with death because even funeral parlors and cemeteries were segregated. On the right, we see a pop machine. Even pop machines were segregated. I don't know if anyone has seen the film Green Book, but the title for that movie uh, was inspired by an actual book. The Negro Motorist Green Book was around for about 30 years, and it helped to identify places where African Americans could go to hotels, restaurants, gas stations, uh, if they were traveling to different areas throughout the United States. Businesses could legally say, no, we will not serve you. And the Negro Motorist Green Book uh, offered opportunities or areas where African Americans could be served. Now we'll explore how different people fought back against segregation and some of the successes they achieved. Schools in the United States were impacted by what came to be known as the Brown Decision. Here we see an image of Linda Brown sitting with her family. She was prohibited from attending the, a school that was close to her because she was black. Her family sued and said, that doesn't sound like equal treatment under the law. Two important individuals shaped this decision, which was eventually handed down by the Supreme Court. On the left, we see Thurgood Marshall. He was an attorney who worked for the NAACP. He worked on behalf of the family and represented them and tried to fight uh, in favor of integration of schools. On the right, we see Earl Warren. He was the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, who worked to overturn segregation in schools. In 1954, the Supreme Court handed down their decision. 
they declared that that doctrine of separate but equal had no business in education. Therefore, segregation in schools was outlawed. Just a few years later, in order to integrate Central High School located in Little Rock, Arkansas, federal troops had to be sent down to protect the children. They were at Central High School for several weeks, and then state forces uh, replaced them. The students faced harassment of all sorts throughout that school year. I was lucky enough to travel to Little Rock a few years ago. I'd like to talk about another example of someone fighting back. Here we see an image of Rosa Parks. Do you know that you can actually visit the actual bus that Rosa Parks was on when she was arrested? It's located in Dearborn, Michigan. So the way it was set up in um, uh, Montgomery, Alabama, is that uh, on the right, you can see the first door. Uh, everyone had to walk in through that first door and pay their money. If you were white, you could sit down. If you were black, you had to walk out of the bus and walk to the, the door in the back of the bus. It was incredibly demeaning for any African-American passengers. The front part of the bus was for white passengers only. The back of the bus was for black passengers only. I was lucky enough to sit in Rosa Parks' seat. She was initially in a middle section. Whites and blacks could both sit there. But if the, the bus began to fill up with white patrons, African Americans were required by law to move to the back of the bus. She refused and was arrested because she was violating the law. She refused to move to the back of the bus. A new minister who had recently arrived in town eventually led this bus boycott. His name was Martin Luther King Jr. If you ever travel to Atlanta, I would encourage you to visit the birth home of Martin Luther King Jr. It's part of a, an outside exhibit of, and, and a, um, a museum, outdoor museum. Um, just a little ways from his birth home would be his final resting place. Martin Luther King Jr. advocated non-violent protest against the city's policy of segregation on the buses. So members of the African American community boycotted. They refused to ride the bus. It lasted a month. It lasted three months, six months. Eventually, the boycott would last over a year. The Supreme Court ruled eventually that the buses had to be integrated and eventually the company did agree to hire black employees. Eventually Congress took action and passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This outlawed or prohibited discrimination in all public places. Essentially it outlawed segregation. Secondly, it outlawed job discrimination based on race and sex. On the right, we see Lyndon Johnson signing the bill into law. What this did was it finally outlawed those Jim Crow laws about 100 years after the end of the Civil War. So far, I've focused on African Americans and the Civil Rights Movement. Now I'd like to switch gears and talk about women. This map identifies the status of women's suffrage or women and the right to vote prior to 1920. The blue states indicate states where women had full voting rights prior to 1920. If you notice, there were only two states east of the Mississippi that allowed women full voting rights. New York and Michigan. Women's rights were transformed in 1920 when the 19th Amendment passed. You can see the text of the actual amendment here, but the bottom line was that the 19th Amendment guaranteed all women the right to vote. Women's access to employment was impacted by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. When this was first being discussed by Congress, it was going to outlaw discrimination in public places based on race but it also was going to outlaw job discrimination based on just on race. 
Well, eventually, two words were added to this bill as it was being discussed, and sex. So eventually, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 became a cornerstone for African American rights, but also women's rights. Women and education were impacted by something called Title IX. I'd like to start with some statistics. In 1972, only 1 in 27 high school girls played sports. In 1970, women made up just a small percentage of law school and medical school graduates. Well, then Congress took action. Congress passed what has been referred to as Title IX regulations in 1972. This prohibited discrimination based on sex in education. Let's go back to those statistics. What we see 30 years after the passage of Title IX is a huge increase in the number of girls playing high school sports. We also see that nearly 50% of the law school graduates were female, and just a little bit lower than that when it comes to medical school graduates. So Title IX had a big impact on women's access to education. Lastly, I'd like to explore a community that's not very far from us, Idlewild, just about, oh, 30 minutes or so um, directly east of West Shore. Idlewild actually has a unique history. It started in 1912 when four white guys decided they wanted to make some money. Their goal was to develop a resort for African Americans. Blacks were not allowed to go to other resorts, so this was a niche market. They began to sell plots that were generally pretty small, about 25 by 100 feet, uh, and they sold for $35 each. There's a really nice entrance to Idlewild today off of US 10. Again, as I said before, it's only about, oh, 30 minutes or so from the college, right on US 10, just east of Baldwin. If you've never been to Idlewild, I would encourage you to travel there. Here we see a former school that's been turned into a museum or cultural center. I'd like to identify two important individuals who lived at Idlewild. The first is shown here. This is Dr. Daniel Williams, often referred to as Dr. Dan. He was a medical doctor from Chicago. He was important because he performed the first successful open heart surgery on a patient. He did so uh, in Chicago, and he lived at Idlewild for many years. Dr. Dan's home is still standing. It's a private residence today. Another important Idlewild property owner and resident is shown here, Madam C.J. Walker. She was the first black millionaires. She made a fortune developing beauty products for African Americans, like makeup and hair care products. She owned property and lived at Idlewild. Idlewild was a happening place. It was a place where African Americans could go and they could actually enjoy themselves. By the 1950s, they didn't have to worry about uh, racism and discrimination. There were at least a thousand summer homes, 50 hotels, and over a dozen churches. They were really well known for their uh, nightclubs uh, and live entertainment. Idlewild had several famous black entertainers as well as visitors. Can you identify any, any of these? On the left, we see Louis Armstrong. On the right, Della Reese, she was a great singer. She was on a TV show called Touched by an Angel. The Four Tops uh, visited Idlewild when they were just starting out. And the famous boxer, Joe Lewis, was a visitor to Idlewild. A few years back, Idlewild was recognized as, quote, the largest and most important historic African-American resort in the country. Not just in Michigan, not West Michigan, but in the United States. Unfortunately, since 1964, Idlewild has declined as a tourist destination. 
If you remember, 1964 saw the passage of the Civil Rights Act. This outlawed discrimination in public places. Well, one unintended consequence of the Civil Rights Act was that um, it led to uh, a bust, I guess you could say, uh, for Idlewild. Blacks could go anywhere they wanted now. Uh, and so that had negative consequences for Idlewild. On the upper left, you see a rock where a famous clubhouse once had stood. Uh, one of the only buildings that's, that remains is uh, shown on the bottom right, and that's the Flamingo Club. Here we see some semi-recent unemployment statistics. Unfortunately, Lake County, where Idlewild was located, um, has some of the highest unemployment rates in the state, uh, and this has been true for quite a while. So one of the negative consequences of that Civil Rights Act was a bust or a downturn in Idlewild's economy. We're just about done. I'd like to identify a few ideas to consider. Well, there are a couple of things that you should be able to do after going through this presentation. First of all, you should be able to identify the legal basis for segregation. Things like uh, the Jim Crow laws and Plessy versus Ferguson. Secondly, you should be able to identify and explain key events in the civil rights movement that impacted women as well as African Americans. Finally, what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to evaluate which of those successes you believe to be the most important. Now, if you want, you can stop uh, watching because I'm going to get a little bit uh, personal here. Uh, but um, I did want to offer some comments about uh, current events, particularly that took place during the summer of 2020, as we saw a great deal of unrest and um, frustration and anger uh, uh, often targeted toward the police um, uh, after violent encounters that have taken place between African-Americans and police officers in particular. I do not believe that members of the police force are any more racist than others in society. However, I do believe, and, and again, I'm getting into my beliefs here, and so that's why hey, you can move on if you want or whatever. But anyway, it is my belief that we do really have systemic racism in the United States, and that one of the factors that has led to this conflict is the legacy of Jim Crow and segregation. And I guess I'll bare my soul here a little bit and use my own life as an example to try to show this. So I was born in a white middle-class family. What if I had been born black? That's kind of the idea that I've got here. So just a little bit about my family. My parents were both born in 1936. My parents both went to uh, college. Um, they, you would essentially say that they had a community college degree. My mom was a nurse. And my dad was a court reporter. In 1954, we see the Brown decision. Um, that didn't have that much of an impact on my family necessarily. But my family lived in a middle-class neighborhood in Seattle, maybe even upper middle-class neighborhood. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was, uh, became law in 1964, and I was born four years later. In 1982, my father died. That was devastating in many ways for my family, uh, for me, but also economically for my family. Yet one of the saving graces is that we lived in this middle class or upper middle class fa uh, neighborhood and one of the next door neighbors that we had was a vice president of a company. What he did was he got me a summer job for four years and that helped to pay, well it paid for my college. Um, and so I doubt that I would have gone to college and received the degree that I had if that next door neighbor hadn't offered a lot of mentorship as well as this opportunity to earn money. I received my master's degree uh, in 1993 and then in 1997 I was hired to teach at West Shore. Well what would have happened if my family was black? Let's look at my parents. They were born in 1936. If my parents were black they would have had access to school, a segregated school. The segregated schools were not as good as the schools for white kids. Would my parents have had an eighth grade education? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe they would have gotten uh, to go to high school as well. But the education that my parents would have had would have been worse because the Brown decision wasn't made until 1954. With that lack of education, would my family have lived in a middle class or upper middle class neighborhood? Unlikely because segregation was legal. The neighborhood that we lived in 
probably would have been segregated. And things like redlining, uh, which was where bankers and real estate agents often would steer African Americans to certain neighborhoods, that was going on well into the 1970s. And so a segregated neighborhood would have probably been the norm for me. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act was passed, so that was good and it would offer opportunity. However, that legacy of Jim Crow and segregation would still be there. When my dad died in 1982, um, as I said before, it was devastating for my family. Um, there probably would not have been a vice president of a company that lived right next door to help me get a good job so that I could pay for school. I probably would have had a high school education, but college, gosh, I don't know. It's possible, but it's unlikely that I ever would have been hired to teach at West Shore. It is very possible that I could have achieved everything that I did if I had been born with black skin. However, there were certain barriers that, were, that would have been put into place if I had been born black. As I say, I worked hard for my schooling and things like that, and I worked hard to, um, uh, to pay for school. But because I was white, I had far fewer barriers in my place. Some people would call this lack of barriers white privilege. Doesn't mean I didn't work hard. Doesn't mean that, that I didn't have uh, things to overcome, but there were fewer barriers simply because of the color of my skin. So anyway, I try not to be too political uh, and let my own um, uh, feelings and, and things like that get involved. I try to be really neutral, but I thought that I would add this as an addendum basically because of the current events uh, and the events of the summer of 2020. Thank you for listening, everybody. Well, that's it for today. I hope you learned something new. Take care and have a good day.